Morning, guys. How you doing? Good, you? Good. Just admitting, uh, admitting people one at a time here. So, just wanted to make sure you guys know that I'm here in Yen. Wanted to wish you guys a good morning in this uh, little COVID uh, environment we got going on here. It's COVID classroom. <laughs> How's everybody doing this morning? Doing good, Pascal. How about you? Good. 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 I am sitting with you. Hey guys. We might have a few little late stragglers in here. I missed a couple last time, but uh, we'll make sure we get everybody uh, organized here. How's everybody doing? Good. Yeah, good. so far so good. It's not the yeah. best. Vancouver. Hey, Travis. Hey. Vancouver, uh, it's pretty good. It's actually blue sky today. Thank God. It was raining like crazy this morning. Oh, yeah, no kidding. God, it's unbelievable. Uh, well, nobody can make up their minds this morning, I guess. So, you know, we're always stuck in this, uh, this wonderful world of getting stuck inside our house. Uh, so um, I'm just going to get started here, guys. I'm going to take one more look here to see if there's anybody stuck in the waiting room. And um, uh, last time, Mike Valley <laughs> was stuck in the waiting room until the very end. <clears throat> he was like, you didn't want me involved? I said, <laughs> I said, no, 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 you're completely allowed to be involved. I don't understand why you didn't... Uh, let me know beforehand. So anyway, we're all set and uh, I'm going to get going here with the, uh, with the series. Going to give you a little bit of a, uh, a background here first. Uh, I'm going to set this up in, in a way where we can um, have a good overview of the introduction to ABCD and then one, two, three of depth management. Uh, I want it to be easy. I'm not going to go through the whole the whole game plan today. Um, I wanted to just introduce it and uh, and kind of spark some, um, you know, spark some ideas in, in some of the other athletes because not everybody sees me as a goaltending coach. There's goaltending coaches that are on here that have great systems and great plans that they've derived by talking to different goaltending coaches and 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 thinking about the game themselves and coming up with a plan that they. Uh, have tried, tested, and proved, and, and it works for their clients. And so I'm, I want to be, this is a little bit of a caveat. Um, this is not the only way. This just is, happens to be one of the, one of the ways that, um, that uh, many goaltenders that are top-level guys use. Um, this is meant to be the rail and braille behind everything, so it's a starting point. So when you're talking about creating a, uh, um, uh, a plan when it comes to depth management or it comes to zoning and things like that or breaking down your battlefield, um, we're creating a feeling. Um, a lot of the time, I remember when I was a younger guy and I was at a provincial championship and I had a, 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 a goaltending guy uh, who was a goaltender at a higher level than me. And then I had a, a coach and they would just say, okay, well, you'll get that feeling. You'll get that feeling. And the biggest thing that you want to do is that how do you create that feeling? I mean, you create um, lines or zones and you know that something has to happen in that particular field. And I'll give you an example. <clears throat> For example, on a breakaway, if you back up too early, you have that feeling in your mind like, oh God, I left too early and I le I'm leaving space to the left and right. Or maybe you went into a position where you went into a butterfly um, but the guy did a fake shot. So now you're down on the ice trying to get up when he passes the puck. It's that feeling that you get, and we've got to try to create those feelings. Um, so I expect questions for sure. Don't be afraid to uh, chime in. We've had a couple of guys that are younger guys that are on here that, you know, are scared, you know, to ask a question online. Hey, listen, this is a friendly environment. This is an egoless environment. Um, you know, this is not a, a situation where, uh, I'm a guru and I'm going to tell you to do and you guys go and do what I tell you to do. This is basically a, a plan that <clears throat> I'm sharing with you guys. It's based on a book that I put together and working with guys that are pretty amazing goaltenders. And, and uh, you know, it's just a common sense approach that allows goaltenders to, to create their own plan as time goes on. 
Before I get started, can everybody hear me okay? And can everybody see my screen right now? Yeah. Give me a thumbs up if you just, or if you're on mute. All right, so this is the introduction here. So first thing is, is I'm gonna skip a lot today. So if you do have questions about things, let me know, but I'll give you some samples of what a game plan is. This is a small piece, okay? So what is game planning? It's, it's your battle plan for success, okay? So it, it works to being um, you know, a success to your team system. So what I mean by that is your team, every team has a coach and every team has a system. Um, and that coach is excited about their certain system and they see it in their mind the way it's supposed to be executed. So if we are doing things in the net that are not conducive to success in that system, the coach is not going to give us the nod uh, in the net. Okay, so we have to make sure that we're paying attention to what the coach wants. We have to make sure that we're paying attention to, um, you know, what the deliverables are. So the second thing is, is the, um, you know, delivers exceptional consistency within your play. So, for example, you know, when Travis Hoy goes home and he turns on his light, uh, you know, turns the switch on his light, the blender doesn't go off. Like he knows every day that he goes in and turns the kitchen light on, the kitchen light's going to turn on. So he knows there's a certain consistent uh, expectation that he's going to get by turn, turning that particular light on. So by having a plan in place and, and an approach to how you want to manage things, um, you can rely on that just like Travis or anybody else would rely on that, on that kitchen light switch. That light's going to go on. And then every team has a different system and personnel. So <clears throat> I went through this this year with some coaches uh, as well, but when you start looking at uh, a plan, maybe the system is incredible. It's laid out like a, I was on a call. Um, some, maybe some of you guys were on it too, but I was on a call where uh, Bill Ranford was delivering uh, some information and he was just talking about the fact that Don Hay is very organized and, you know, a pretty special guy. He organizes the entire training camp down to the minute. And a lot of top level coaches do that. Same with you guys as goalie coaches and, and what as goaltenders attending this line and parents that you want to see every minute capitalized. So the thing to take into consideration is that, yeah, you may have a great system, but maybe four of, four of the six or seven defensemen aren't very talented, you know, yet. They understand how to play. They've got great talent, but at the same time, they just don't make good decisions so that you have to be that extra special goaltender in the net. So those things are very, very important when you're, when you're trying to come through is understand the DNA of your team, understand what's going to work, what's going to be a risky moment and what's going to contribute to your defenseman getting out of your zone. I said this before, I, I call it the rodeo. Um, and it's basically a term I stole from, from another coach down in Wisconsin. Um, and uh, he's a head coach of the Wisconsin Badgers. And he said, it's a rodeo. You know, you got eight seconds in your zone, you ride the horse for eight seconds, you get that puck back and you get it out of your zone. And if you do that, you have success. And ultimately, when you look at the years that Brian Elliott was there, you start to see a lot of, a lot of championships being won. The second thing is it allows for intervention and reinvention to your game. So when you have a game plan, there's a simple customized system that allows you to make, uh, to move from decision to instinct. So instead of playing every single shot the exact same way and you go out and you, and you play no matter how big, thick, or wide the zone is, um, you are going to, you're going to derive uh, cer certain rebounds in certain situations that are not going to be conducive to your success. So you want a, a simple system that you can remember, uh, but more importantly, a simple system that you can gravitate to um, and not overthink things. Because when you start, when you look at the pro diagram that I show you, you're going to go, oh my God, I got to memorize all these things. No, you got to memorize one zone at a time, one layer of depth at a time. And all of the lines on the ice <clears throat> are already there. They're, they've been in the game for a hundred years, okay, minus the trapezoid. The next thing it, that it allows, which is right here, number two in the, middle, uh, in the middle area here, is your goalie coach and you can work with it. You can change it. You can check it. So on a certain play, you have the ability to say, okay, well, what's your game plan when a player drives below the goal line and attacks the net? Okay, what did you do in this situation? You know, does it match what you had planned and practiced? And uh, maybe what you did was exactly what you needed to do, but now the other team identifies the fact that you're going to be executing this type of situation. The more you play, the more video evidence of your performances are. And the more you have to look at ways to kind of cap, you know, capitalize on other players. 
The third aspect in the, in the center here is going to be the more you play, the more video exists, reinvention and alterations. So this is where I find a lot of the NHL goaltenders. So then when they came to the access camp and, and Mike's camp in Madison with Dave Alexander and, and uh, the rest of the guys from the league, um, the biggest thing that, that I saw was guys that came in with a lot of success were really scared um, to make some adjustments, even though the, um, the weaknesses may be there. Uh, they were scared to make adjustments because if you change a little bit, then it could affect the success that you're having already. So why not just stick it out? And even though there's a certain situation that you bite at all the time and, and get scored on, it's one of the, you know, 10, 20, 35 different scoring situations that you have to worry about and you play the odds. Um, the key is, is that if you notice, Carter Hart <clears throat> had a fantastic rookie season. And Jordan Bennington had a fantastic, you know, rookie season, if you can call it a rookie season, because he's been around the game a long time and learned. But when you have goaltending coaches uh, that are out there, and for example, in Dave's situation in, in St. Louis, he's able to communicate with Jordan. Jordan really wants it. And, and those types of things can come out and you can come up with a plan that works best. I'm not going to, Dave has shared a, a few different things with me that he's worked on with uh, Jordan Bennington <clears throat> that I thought were really good. <clears throat> but I don't have the permission to share them on here, so I'm not going to, but just little things that help keep him in the game that help him, you know, maintain his identity. But at the same time, you have the ability to, uh, to work on things that are going to help you become the best you possibly can be. Um, and then the last part here, it says your game is broken down into specific situations. So in minor hockey, there's 10 scoring situations, and that's not something that we created. That's something that that Finland and, and uh, Sweden have come up with. And Finland actually came up with these scoring situations. And what they did was they broke down the scoring situations um, for a minor hockey goaltender that you're able to understand and break down and, and come up with a battle plan to address those. So the same way a baseball player would, would you know, practice hitting curveballs or screwballs or, or sliders or things like that, um, we have to do the exact same thing, whether it's a net drive or whether it's a below the goal line attack or whether it's an east west or north south pass or whether it's a rush or whether it's a carry and shoot, whether it's a screen and deflection. You guys picking up what I'm putting down here? These things are really important. So we go down to the next one here. So I personally use 20. I just finished my second book and, and it's called Building Elite Level Goaltenders. And in that book, it helps support the workbook because the workbook is only really made for clients that I've worked with. And some other goalie coaches have, have gotten it. I know Casey Goaltending's on here. He, he put together a game plan for his goaltenders. It works really well. Like people that use these, these game planning elements are, are really important. And I think that 10 is a good one to start off with if you're in minor hockey. If you're in junior, you're probably going to gravitate. You're going to move from that 10. And once you've mastered, mastered it, you're going to move to your, your 20 and then move on. I know that that, uh, that Dave uh, in St. Louis uses a lot. He, it's, it's somewhere in the 30s, the low 30s. And, and, uh, but that's breaking down, you know, minute situations and finding things. And I use Dave as an example <clears throat> because he's the youngest and probably the brightest mind in the, um, in the National Hockey League as goaltending coaches. And, you know, he sacrificed a lot. So if you ever get a chance to meet Dave Alexander, make sure you meet him and ask him his journey. Believe me, he deserves the Stanley Cup ring. Um, so we're going to move on from this here. And I'm just going to give you an example. This is like a number five. Um, can you guys see this okay? I don't think I can make it bigger here, but um, basically, if you look, this is post play. Okay. And, and, and in an example here, if you go to the top, it says accepting the post and it says it three times in a row. Do you guys see that? And in there, it says pad in post. So that would be your toe scoop or whatever terminology you're going to be using. Um, one is going to be skate on post and one is going to be on toe, one is going to be toe bridge on post. So in these, you can see it says tight plays in front or behind the net attacks from, uh, you know, from the goal line, like all these different things. Those are just samples of what your plan might be that you'd slide in there. But more importantly, yeah. Sorry, screen to, sharing. sorry to interrupt. I don't think anybody can see your screen right now. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> let's see. Okay. So uh, sorry about that. You didn't miss much. Uh, let's go into Zoom here. Let's go to share screen. Now you'll be able to see it. You see it now? Yeah, there we go. All right. All right. All right. So let's see here. Keep hitting that one thing and it bugs me. All right. 
All right, so do you see the screen now? You didn't miss much, guys. That's what you missed, <laughs> okay? So right in here, you've got, um, you know, accepting the post, pad and post, and then type plays in front. Those are just little things, notations that you can put in to the game plan book. Now, your game plan is going to change all the time, but these are different things that you can work on when you're working on post play. And then more importantly, like you can, if Dave, if Dave Strathos is your goaltending coach, you can go in and go, hey, I'm really excellent at pad and post. Uh, I'm really excellent at skate on post, but I, I really need to develop a game plan for toe bridge on post. Um, then you can show that to your goalie coach and then you can say, uh, no, I think we need to work on skate on post as well because there's other things such as bumping off the post to gain depth and there's other things that you need to, need to think about as we start going on. So you're on the right path, but we need to develop a game plan for it. And by working together, you can say your average. That to me tells me you need to go work on a game plan. If you're developing a game plan, it means you need to develop your game plan. And if you're excellent, then your coach and you can go together and go, yeah, we're really happy with the way you execute these. Now, as a goaltending coach with the national program and the women's program, um, we talked about skate on post, uh, pad and post. And, you know, the problem is, is you get a lot of goaltending coaches will, will teach and they'll say skate on post is the only way to do an RVH. Well, the challenge is, is that, you know, the top level players know that. So they know that if you're, if a player is coming around the tight around the goal and they see your cowling and your skate blade on the post, they can knock it off your bum or off the back of your mask or off the cowling of your skate. Like they're pretty smart people. And what they, when they start looking is they start looking when they go behind the net. As soon as they go behind, they're looking at your foot to see how you're going to engage the post. And if you go to a toe box on post, which is, you know, the toe bridge, they'll move further away from you and then they'll try to get you off that post. So there's lots of little things that you can work on. But I wanted to show you um, just a sample of what that would look like. I'm just going to check and see real quick here. I'll, uh, let me just go back here. Let me just go up here and get my mouse. Sorry, I got three guys in here, and uh, they're great guys that want to get in. Um, I don't know if you guys know who Mason Beauprit is, but he's a great guy, and he's uh, the Spokane with the Spokane Chiefs. And then we've got uh, Chris Holt, which is uh, one of my favorite goaltenders I've ever trained. Um, he, he's an amazing guy, and we've worked together quite a bit. Um, he works for a, a, a nice big company, and then Jeremy Davis. So I'm just going to try to get in here real quick. There we go. All right, sorry guys. Make sure we got everybody there. All right. So um, we talked about a little bit about above and be, uh, above and below the goal line. So you can see you can see that. Can you see um, what I'm looking at here, guys? Just got to get out of this thing. Out of tape. Sorry, got a little bit of a. There we go. Let me just get back here. I got to get rid of this thing. Sorry, guys. Get back into here. There we go. All right. So as we get in, in here, we're, we're looking at like post play above and below the goal line tasks and things like that. And it becomes really important uh, as you start to go through that you're recognizing that there's a lot of different situations. Okay, and I'll go over some of them as we start to go through here, but um, this part right here is the pro framework and, and the 10 ways they'll try to, to beat you and the strategy to defend it. So we'll, we'll take a look at some of these. So task nine in, in the game plan workbook is, is like depth and the 10 scoring situations, okay? Since I've I wrote this, um, there, I've now upped mine to, to 20 because of the, of the higher level goaltenders that, that have mastered the first part of it. Now they move on to the second part of it. But when you look in here, you're looking at scanning and gathering information. Do you guys see that at the top? So when do you scan? You know, give me an example. Uh, anybody just uh, throw something out there. Uh, when the player turns. So a player like, turns, uh, yeah. Back the other way. Yeah, so he turns away from you, see their, ha their helmet, their numbers, and their, and their last name. Probably a, a decent time that you can scan. What's another situation? After you recovered. After you recover, so you made a save and then you're, you're tracking the puck in a post-save recovery and then you get up 
into position you can scan. Next, keep it simple. Battle in the corner. What's that? A battle in the corner. So a 50-50 battle in the corner absolutely is another good chance. What's another one? Think of zone entry in a, on an odd man rush. So the players skating up the ice through the neutral zone, it'd be a good idea to scan to see, you know, what players are coming down the rush with you and things like that. So you again would be able to go through these checklists. And the whole purpose of this is just to show you a checklist that does exist, that has the information in it so that you can break the game down into smaller bite-sized pieces and become super efficient. So I'm going to get into tactical plans now, the ABCs of depth management and control. The first thing we need to understand and, um, is – and uh, Dave Alexander measured this out um, uh, for one of the camps we did in Access. But if you take a look at uh, box control and game planning, if you look at the face-off dot to the center of the net, um, that that's a distance of 24 feet. Now, if you slide that 24 feet into the into that middle uh, that middle section there, it says five feet, 10 feet, 15, 20, 25. So somewhere close to the 25 feet, the net is 35 or sorry, 37.5 inches, okay? And what I mean by that is at the edge of the crease, six feet away from the goal line, the top of the net is 37 inches. It's not 48 inches anymore, right? Because it's slanting down in, in, in the puck's trajectory when you're starting to decode um, uh, any type of movement or any type of uh, access to the net. Does that make sense to you guys? So as you've got a, a trajectory that goes right through to the puck, the net is not going to be as big. It's not going to be the same, it's the same shape, especially when you move left or right or further back. Okay. You can see that if you're five feet away from the net, so inside what I call the block zone, five feet away, the net, the top of the net is 22 inches. So it's less than two feet tall. So when you're looking at that stuff, you can put your hand right over top of the puck and use projected angle. You can, you can maintain a good seal because the majority of your body should be at the two and a half foot mark and, and below and ceiling and uh, you have the ability to use your paddle down and things like that so those are just some examples of if you know what you're if you know what you're covering then you have the ability to um, you have the ability to make all the different changes that you need to make and make sure that you're covering uh, all of the elements that you need to cover okay All right, and this is a trajectory and box control kind of in one diagram. So when you're looking at a puck, which is that white little puck that says puck proximity, and then it, it's gonna travel through a vector. And believe it or not, I mean, the, the latest 737 airplanes, that's how they travel to where they're going, is they travel through vectors, through boxes in the sky, into the next, to, into the next radio signal, and then it turns. This type of situation is that Carey Price in this situation is blocking everything that's entering the entrance way, which are those four boxes that you see in front of you. There's not always four boxes. There could be one box or two box. The key is to recognize that the closer that you are to the puck, the smaller the box or entrance way is going to be. So in essence, about four feet away from the box, if you put a crate, one of those milk crates, uh, that we usually carry pucks in and you put it down on its ed on its side it doesn't matter what you do unless you put unless you s put the puck over top of it and let it bounce to the net you can't shoot it through that box into the uh, you know into the net it's going to be enough to block the space you don't need a six foot six goalie to block the space and frankly this is what a lot of general managers need to understand too is that you know the top of the net's only 37 inches anyway so you don't need to be seven feet tall to be there it does help but you don't actually need it. So does anybody have any questions about the vertical angle, horizontal angle? Vertical is obviously from the ice to the crossbar and horizontal is from left to right. Okay. What do you notice about Carey Price's head <clears throat> in this situation? Anybody? He's just above it. It represents the, the crossbar. Yeah, right. Just Repre above it. Yeah. So as his eyes, his eyes represent the crossbar, his head's going to be a little higher <clears throat> than that, but his eyes represent the crossbar and he's just peeking up above that box. So when you start hearing the, the terms um, tracking down or closing down on pucks, that's what we're talking about here. So you can see Carey Price's hand is angled down towards the puck. His head is angled down towards the puck, but he's above the box. Anything that's going to happen below his chin or below his eyes He's going to move into the areas he doesn't cover. 
And that's really what the secret to a uh, trajectory and box control is, is minimizing the net space by using um, diagrams and by using math. Okay. Can you guys see this diagram okay? The whole thing or am I in the way here? No, you're good. I'm good? Okay. I'm just going to move you guys over a little bit. So in here, I'm just going to go up to the top here. Usually I use a video for this, but uh, today I decided to, last night when I was putting it together, I wanted to make sure that uh, everything ran smoothly. So now I'm stuck <laughs> trying to move this box. Okay, here we go. Um, perfect. Okay, so the strategies here, you're taking a look at what a traditional um, kind of NHL view would be for, for goaltenders. Um, so when you look at, when you look at an important tactical information, um, if you break the zones up into sections, you guys remember the four things you need to control, which was in the last presentation. Does anybody remember one of them? What's the, what are the four things that you absolutely need to control in order to have a, a perfect game? The puck. Number one, you have to stop the puck from moving. Okay. The player. The player. Now the player Yourself is carrying can. the puck, right? Mm -hmm. So what else do you need to stop from moving? Uh, yourself. Yourself, which is the last one, and? The net. The, the net. net. Okay. So when you come down, if you're taking a look at a player coming down to the neutral zone and then entering, say, that zone two section. And the reason why I call these zones one, two, and three, I'll, I'll let you know why we call it that. Zone one is no wider than an average goaltender. It takes one goaltender to cover that space with your skate on the post. In zone two, in order for you to protect zone two, if you're on the goal line, it would take two goaltenders <clears throat> of average size <clears throat> to protect that same space. So what, how do you turn one goal or two goaltenders into one? What's the one way we become bigger? Anybody? Uh, yeah. Depth. Challenge shooter. Depth. Challenge, depth, absolutely. So you move out. So you go from two goaltenders to one goaltender, and I'll go into that in a few minutes. So now you got to come out. Um, and in zone three, there's a couple of sides. There's a left side, right side, and you can break it up any way you want. The whole idea is this is basically just the rail and braille of where you would start because every goalie is different. And you can, after you mes mes memorize these things, you have the ability to customize afterwards. Okay. So when you're looking at these types of things, it, depth becomes important. But when you have a puck and you skate down through three into zone two, okay. Have you stopped the player from moving if he's, if he's skating around in zone two? <clears throat> yes or no? Yes, you have. You stopped the player from moving because when you're in position in zone two, what have you essentially done? You've challenged. You're now at the edge of zone two. Let's say he's your only threat. We're not setting up for a pass. We're keeping it really simple. You set up. So now you've stopped the player and the puck from moving. You've also stopped a third thing from moving. What was it? We already stopped us. So what was the, the third thing that we don't control? <clears throat> the net, right? So now the net stopped, the player stopped, the, the puck stopped, and we've stopped. Now that player can do whatever they want in that scenario. They can deke through guys, around guys, put the puck to their legs, and then release the shot. If they release the shot, you're still going to have the best opportunity to stop the puck. What's going to change that uh, positioning? I gave one of the one of the examples away already. When when the player moves from a different zone. When a player moves from a different zone, but the easiest way would be how would your depth be changed if you had a backside. second attacker? Yeah. So if you had backside pressure, you wouldn't be able to challenge that one player with the puck fully and, and maximum. You're going to have to split the difference mm -hmm. so that you can have not only sight but access. Going back to that first practice that we we showed when the players were coming down on two on ones. The goalie clearly had sight, was clearly tracking the puck, but he didn't have physical access to the puck. He didn't have the ability to turn with it. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is zone one, two, three, two, and one. We keep it simple. Zone three, it takes three goalies on the goal line to cover the whole net. In order to become one, you challenge. If it's zone two, you have two goalies to cover the net. If you want to become one, you challenge. And then zone one is simple. You're in that, you're in that position. Now you can see all of these little words here. It says overlap or skate on post um, in here. Now in here I have um, right along the goal line and then there's a dotted line that touches the bottom of the circle. It says skate on post 
um, to load for VH or RVH. So RVH above the goal line is changed. There's a lot of goaltenders that are getting completely destroyed with pucks um, going into the net when players are attacking above the goal line. Now, am I right to say we're no longer ever going to do it every goalie gets beat? No, because it might be the best P, uh, maneuver for one particular goaltender that it works for. But we would select something that works for us. So we would select VH or we would select uh, an overlap or we would select an RVH or we would select, you know, a standing position or butterfly to block out. Whatever we would select, we would make that as a part of our game plan. I can tell you that through a lot of research last season and the season before on RVH that a lot of goalies and Sidney Crosby is tearing goalies apart um, on, on that side. And um, like Carey Price, he has a timing mechanism. And that is as soon as he, as soon as the puck touches the bottom of the circle, um, he goes into an RVH. And then what it does is it releases the defenseman on the opposite side. So those are things that are that become really important when you're when you're uh, dealing with these types of things. It's so important that we we focus on these. Um, let me just see if I can move you guys over. So is this helping you guys? You guys are, are you guys picking up stuff that makes sense? Oh yeah. So if you go down the top of the screen, I uh, can't have a little mouse here. But if you go down the top of the screen and then you end up touching the bottom of the circle where that blue RVH line starts, where it says RVH, just understand that that's what a lot of goalies are doing now. They get down in an RVH. And then what, as soon as they do that, as soon as they release in an RVH, the bottom three, you see that, that in zone three on the opposite side, players start to leave. That defenseman leaves. Nobody's watching that D-man anymore and they're passing right across. And that's one of the crutches that Carey Price has when he's playing um, these types of plays because they've picked up his, um, they've picked up his, his tell, his timing mechanism. So I want you to keep that in mind. They're, like Every goalie has a different timing mechanism. So you got to make sure that you're, you're paying attention um, to where uh, you're standing, when you execute, and do you still have the opportunity to gain access to the rest of the zone. So I put down what's, when you scan, you look down what zone, what section, what shot hand is the player? Um, what's the puck proximity, the movement? Is it a stationary setup or is it a movement setup? Uh, and what is the developing play? Those are all just simple questions you ask yourself as you're starting to build this plan. So when you scan, you're looking at, I, I tell goaltenders to look at three things. Number one, when you scan, you look at what zone are they in? Because that's going to tell me where I'm going next. Number two, what hand is that player? It's going to tell me whether it's going to be a one-time or, or a reception or a short receive. And then the third thing, is the player stationary or are they driving the net, stationary or moving? Those, those three things are enough for me to, you know, send a hook out and come back, send a hook out and come back. So when you're scanning the, uh, for the next most dangerous player, those, those three elements will tell you a lot about what your next movement is going to be. So here's the ABCs uh, and the Ds of depth management. Um, so when you look, I, I called it ABC because I wanted to make sure that um, the letters related directly to what action you are going to take. Okay, so we're going to start off with control. So anything on the outside, um, anything on the outside in green there is control. You're expected to stop the puck. You're expecting to control it. You're expecting to elevate the puck. You're expecting to cover it or smother it. Your coach expects you to, to control the puck from that area. If you're allowing pucks uh, in that zone, okay, if you're allowing things to take place in that scenario, um, then, then coaches are not going to trust you with their, with their pattern. So it's really important. Just lost this for a second. Hey, Pasco. Yeah. Uh, so on that, uh, if you can go back a slide or two. Yeah, for uh, sure. I'm going to come back here. Just gonna so is this, is this typically a game plan you'll bring? So when you sit down with your goalies during season, is this typically a slide or like necessarily quote unquote a game plan you'll establish ahead of time with the head coach along with your goaltenders? Or is this something just between you guys? I do it in, that's a great question. I do it in stages. So for example, um, if I've got a goaltender that's in a, a, a you know, peewee style goaltender, I will manage the scoring situations because the, 
um, the head coach is really trying to get his players to pay attention and do the things that they need to do uh, to get the most out of it. If that makes okay. sense. Like they're not, yeah. they're not really refined, you know, that refined enough where they're going to, um, where they're going to play a, a really big or key role. I'm just going to toggle in and out of here so I can show you, but oh, that's um, fine. so I'll, I'll focus on the 10 scoring situations. So I'll focus on, you know, clear shots. I'll focus on screens, deflections. I'll focus on things like that and work on building a plan. So it prepares the Adam and Pee Wee goaltender to face the situations comfortably. And then okay. as the player goes and moves from Pee Wee to Bantam, these are things where I ask the goaltenders, okay, now you want to let your coach know that if they run video sessions, you'd, you'd ask them politely, can I sit in on all defensive and offensive sessions quietly in the back and write notes? Because I want to know what our team is trying to do to their goaltender. So it makes me a smarter goaltender because it gives me a peek inside the opposition of what they're trying to do to me. Okay. And then, um, and then uh, you sit in with the defensive system for a couple of reasons. Number one, you want to know what the D-man need uh, to get them out of the zone as fast as possible. Number two, you want to do a, an inventory of your defensemen. So, for example, in that scenario, you want to know that you can trust your defensemen or who's your top two guy, who are your top two guys and, you know, who's the guy that's really struggling this week or that's in the coach's doghouse that really has been – I don't know, he's, he's he coughed up a couple of pucks over the last couple of games that, that cost us a goal. Like, you want to, you know, constantly keep your, your, um, you know, your, you know, your finger on the pulse, uh, if you will, because these guys are going to be, uh, are going to be playing in front of you, and ultimately they're your, your first and second layer of protection. And if that player breaks past them all, you want to know where is it most likely going to happen? What side is it most likely going to happen? And it allows me to prepare more appropriately as a goaltender. But the reason why yeah. I do it in, in Adam and Pee Wee, because when they get to Bantam, um, in Bantam, I'm trying to teach a Bantam goaltender. So in this case, like your 11 and 12 year old goalie, I'm trying to teach the 11 year old goaltender to be um, more of a little man or a, a woman, if that's the case, if, you know what I mean? Asking yeah. the coach, engaging in the coach, because the year after in BC, they're getting drafted into the Western Hockey League or, you know, things like that. Um, and they need to be prepared because if they go see friends of mine that are goalie coaches in the Western League or the Ontario League or Quebec Major Junior League, well, they're going to expect them to know how to manage these situations, right? They're going to expect yep. them to know how to communicate with a coach and not be a shy little person. So in BC, we have to do it a little bit faster. I'm not sure if that's the, like it, for me, I've written lots of articles on, you know, if we keep talking about goaltenders needing time to develop, then why do we draft them so early? You know, like, so the, the key is, is to, is to try to develop their mind. And I don't think cognitively, like I've been blessed to train a lot of goalies that are young and they went a year early to the NCAA, but you ask yourself, yeah, mentally there are, you know, physically they can do all of the skills, but mentally or cognitively, did we rush the process? So yeah. we have to ask ourselves like, you know, what's the balancing act? So that's a long winded answer. Um, no, thank uh, you. Hopefully it makes sense. Yes, sir. Um, and feel free to answer, ask anything you like. Um, this little line here down at the bottom, I don't know if you guys see it here. It's this red line that goes along the circle, right? In minor hockey, that would be the case. But, you know, if you're looking at junior A, uh, midget, midget to junior, like midget to, to junior and above that first line, that's where this line would be moved to. It would move from here to here. And then somewhere in that process, like you could use that line okay, I'm going to start backing up when the stick reaches there or when his hands reach there or when the player's body reaches their skates. So you can use that as a timing mechanism as to when you're going to start backing up. And uh, from what I found that in, in looking at uh, one of the things I was tasked with with Mike was look through the top and most successful goalies in the NHL on shootouts. When the player comes down, <clears throat> I found that every time the puck touched this line right here, didn't matter which goalie it was, their skates were always touching the line. So whether it was Henrik Lundqvist, which historically has, has been known as a goalie that plays a little bit deeper, um, or you have other guys that play really super aggressive, like, um, oh, drawing a blank now, but uh, Ryan Miller, like he would come out on shootouts and he'd come like three, four feet above the, above the crease, but he, they'd all end up in the same spot with success. So Having that game plan and knowing where you feel comfortable, how you can have flow plays a huge, huge role. And hopefully I can answer some of these questions as we move on here. 
So in here, this is control. This is what you're expecting from yourself and what your coaches expect from you as well. This section right here where it's like the circle comes across and then the circle and it's below the tops of the circle. So you guys see that, that diagram? That's action, reaction, recovery. So you have enough time to, to act, react to the puck, and then recover quickly. And what I try to talk to the goaltenders about is when you make the save anywhere in this area, by the time the puck gets to these, uh, this setup for, for face-offs, you should be recovered. And they go, yeah, it makes sense. It's harder than you think. <laughs> so a lot of guys are recovering when the puck is way over here. So we need to really act, recover, uh, act, react, and recover very quickly to the point where we can make a save. And as that puck reaches here, we should be on our feet. We should be in a position to be able to defend the net. And that's a, that's a good goal to have. Uh, I know that a couple of goalie coaches, they start with it being a little bit wider and then they move it and move it and move it and move it. I'm totally fine with that as long as you have a, um, you know, that communication with your goaltender and, and, and they believe that they can push for it and the goalie coach can use it as, hey, this thing is working. Uh, I do want to apologize in advance if we allow somebody in here and then they screw it up for us. So we'll, uh, I'll quickly make up another Zoom call and then I'll, uh, I'll send it out to you guys. But um, so in this last section here, block, this section here, I'll go into a little bit more detail, but that's where you butterfly block, your butterfly sliding, you're sealing the posts, you're, you're really taking care of yourself in those scenarios. So I start looking at little timing mechanisms on zone entry. So the goal line, the reason why this is a timing mechanism is because the player will enter zone three, but then as soon as they cross this blue line, they're in zone two, which I'll go through. So it's just giving you an idea of, of how I'm dividing zone three and zone two up so that you can now have, you know, access to the puck and access to what that scenario looks like. And I use timing mechanisms based on when things should happen, when you should start thinking about moving. So that's what it just looks like in, in regards to scanning. Um, you know, obviously pucks going from left to right, you're scanning to see where these, where these players are moving. They could, you know, when the puck moves from left to right, you're going to know that there's going to be a guy that's going to tee up here. So you're going to be expecting like a bank off pass back to the middle for a one timer. And it's just training goaltenders to get into positions. So when I look at this one, this is control. So those are the five positions in control that we look at. Um, and, uh, you know, if we, if we, pra we practice all of our skating, there's nothing different. Um, it looks like a W. Every one of you guys has done. Uh, skating drills that allow you to get to these positions. Um, I'm a, a goaltending coach that believes not only do you need to get to those positions, but you need to get to all five layers of depth in your crease. So there's 125% of your crease, there's 100, there's 75, there's 50, there's 25, and there's a lot of goal line play. So when you start looking at, at positioning, if I, if I break this back, when the when you draw the zones out onto the ice, do you got, what do you guys see in the crease? What do you guys see in the crease? A triangle. A triangle. A triangle. Isn't that amazing? Now, if you think about Henrik Lundqvist's game, like, does that start to make sense to you guys? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And the, when I'm talking about the um, retreating backwards and then uh, executing a pivot to get to the middle, um, you're you're um you're allowing yourself to come back this way and then as you get here you're pivoting but look at where you are you're on the top of that crease if that makes sense so the secret to that whole process is really getting into a position where you don't have to move much you're protecting the majority of the net and those positions are key critical so if you look at you know your zone one position uh you see where it's where carry price is on the right side where he's at the edge of the crease that line is zone one okay and when you look at where he's standing um he's in he's protecting zone two so that line to the left of carry price on the he's on the right side the line to the left of carry price is attached to the blue line and um and the goal line is attached to the to the post so in this scenario it's very difficult for someone to score uh on a player so we'll watch it from this perspective i just want to make sure that this might be loud so i apologize Okay, so 
uh, we'll go back again. The, the big thing here to recognize the fact that, that um, let's take a look at where Brian Elliott is when this shot is taken. So watch his feet. So it's a shot from the point. It's a shot from the point. Um, I'm just going to turn this down uh, and let's go back. He did a, you know, he did a really good job all the way through. He's watching them. He's tracking now. Did he scan? No. Not really. Right. And uh, so when, when you see a curl, what zone is this guy in right now? What, what zone is, uh, is uh, um, three. He's in three right now. He's in two right now. Two. And what do they usually do when they go into zone two to create time and space? And they turn the back. They oh. delay. So when they delay, he's now he's now disorganized disorganizing the def defensive system for Philly. And then here comes the pass and the one timer. Boom. And look at where uh, Elliot is. So his feet are inside the blue paint, roughly at about seventy five crease. And uh, he's not fully square, and it catches him on that short side. So it's not to say that Els is a bad goalie. He's a great goalie. <laughs> uh, it, just, it just goes to show that when you're in those positions, it's, it becomes really, really tough if you're not paying attention to where you are. So here's that picture again. Beats him. And then here it is. A, here's another play here. So what depth do you see on this goaltender? 75. Three quarters. Three. Yeah, 75 yeah. or three quarters. So let's see it. Okay. Now keep in mind, we're tearing apart goalies in the NHL that are <laughs> making decisions in milliseconds, uh, but they're our greatest teachers. So we can, we take a look here and then there's, if we take a look at how Demko is, his skates are not square up to the, to where the puck is. Now they're square, but he's putting a lot of weight on the right skate, but there should be a scan to identify the next most dangerous player, which clearly based on the body language of the player, that's a D there's your, there's your man right there. Okay. So you can see a little bit of a pivot and then gets to position, gets set. He's in a wide stance and then boom, gets him on that side. So he has a little bit of double, double coverage there and gets beat. We'll let it run. But he's at three quarter crease and that shot is taken just outside the action reaction section. So again, being at the edge of the crease is a really important thing. He has got no backside pressure to worry about. It's a one timer and we need to get into position a little bit earlier. I call that um, more um, advanced tracking. So if you look at McKinnon, he's there, right? Now he's gonna start moving through and then moving backwards now to the outside of the line, boom. Really important to get into those scenarios. So game plan, uh, so action, reaction, and recovery section, the ability to recognize the next most dangerous player. So in this section here, you have enough time to act, react, recover. Uh, those are the lines that you'd, you'd uh, utilize to, to maintain your depth or to identify what you need to do in those, in those zones. Those are timing mechanisms. And then we get into where you would stand. So these are three quarter crease positions. If you notice the, the two on the poster, they don't change, um, but you start to lose a little bit of depth because you need to get closer to that triangle we talked about so that we need to get closer to that triangle here that we, that we talked about so that we can you know, get to those other passes. So if there's a pass from two to three, you can be in position. If there's a pass from zone two to zone two on an east-west, you have the ability to get close to the other side and, and move into position. So we'll go back to this here. We'll see Kerry get into position and then we'll move into um, Riddick. So what do you notice in this position here? He's in his RVH almost until he's into zone two. Any, any other goalie coach like it, don't like it in this particular situation, or it doesn't really matter as long as they can recover from it? Based not a big a fan. Game, yeah, not a big fan. I mean, based on a game plan, um, I don't know. There's not really a threat of a shot there. And if there was maybe a BH might be more appropriate or even an overlap since we can see all five of their players on the same side of the ice. Do you guys see that? And those are, 
those are scenarios that we're obviously looking at, right? We wanna, we wanna make sure that when we're scanning, we can identify everybody. So can everybody count the five jerseys that are white? Yeah. Yeah, they're on the same side of the ice. So there's really no reason to RVH. And then what happens when you get into that position, it, put, it, puts, you into a, it puts you into a real vulnerable position to be able to get up finally. So right away, here's that delay, and then there's the pass, and now he's just getting up. You see that? Into position, and now what happens every time a puck goes uh, above the rails? Or it's a term, yeah, what happens down. when the puck goes above the circles? What, what always happens? What do you see forming? Screens? Guys? Yeah. As soon as the puck is brought from low to high, now everybody's going to go into the shooting lane to try to disrupt your vision. You see that? Riddick can stop any shot from, you know, tops of the circles, I'm sure. But when you start taking frames away, some of you guys were talking about screens. When you start taking frames away on the release, okay, you know, and then there's a potential little deflection off of the flames uh, stick there. Do you see that? So right there, there might be a little bit of a deflection. You, you put yourself in a bad spot. Where do you see Riddick's feet? Not tech, not square, not square, and half and it's like fifty. He's about fifty crease. Now, does he have a worry um, with Seminoff there? Is it Seminoff? Yeah. So he does kind of, but he has no idea he's even there anyway. So yeah. he's still gonna, he's still gonna, you know, buy the farm and go after this puck. So in essence, you might be able to hear him or even see that stick come into play. You know, you're gonna have to control your rebound because all your players are in front of you. So recognizing those things become really important, but uh, obviously that player uh, played a great decoy. So here's another look at it from the point and uh, it beats him. So those things become important. Now this one's tracking with movement. This one's uh, flurry. Sorry, no fault. You guys see that? So what ends up happening in this scenario here, you got Fleury, who is an amazing goaltender, obviously. He's in a set position, can't really see, kind of gets settled in. I'd love to see what the clock says as far as how much time is there. But here comes the, the, the position. He starts to delay to create time and space. Now look at, look at Fleury right now. Where are his toe caps? Facing, facing up. up ice. Yeah, they're fa he's facing almost the other goaltender. So now he's going to have to make a turn here. So he does the long way around with his right skate. And then there's the pass. You see that? There's the pass. And now Flurry's not quite set. You can see his muscles flex now to move. Then he gets to position. And if he moves to the left, where are they most likely going to shoot? Close the right. The so again, he's stuck at around the, 50, around the 50 crease range. That's arguably at the edge of action, reaction, and control. But we're not going to split hairs here. I mean, he should have a little bit more depth there. He's got nobody that's in that position. And if he wants to take advantage of Lance Fogg, he has to get up into that position and allow the pressure to form around him, if that makes sense. Any goalie coaches want to chime in on that? If you want me to re move the video back, I'll do it and stop. Just let me know. All right, going on to the next one here. So, um, this one here, I, I called this getting out of the way. So this is another one. Okay. So when a, when a goaltender is in position, even if you're in the right spot, so in his case, he's playing 125 because the passer is clearly, you know, going to have a difficult time in, or the receiver sorry, is going to have a difficult time receiving the puck. So he goes to shoot the puck. And what does the goalie do? Lean away. Leans away to create space for the glove. When in reality, where would that puck have likely hit him had he just sat there? Shoulder. Right in the shoulder. Yeah. So we have to get used to, you know, I think one of the most expensive pieces of equipment besides our pads is our chest protector. And being square to the puck is important. And, and, and it's a travesty that we turn away from the puck. Frankly, what you're seeing is me playing when I was 16 years old. And I think I think every single shot was this, and I would make the if it hit me, I would be like, "Yay!" I'd, you know, I'd be a champion. And if it went in, it was just it must have been a good shot. So having the patience to be square and set feet are really important, and recognizing the fact that it's a two-on-two -two even man rush. So you're you're welcome to challenge, 
um, as long as you have trust in your defenseman to be able to play like this defenseman has played. He put a good position there. and He shouldn't be coming down on rails. He should be skating because if there is a rebound, that uh, the Colorado Avalanche player has a good shot at, at getting him. So we gotta, we got to stay away from turning away from shots. Sorry, someone was saying something? Uh, yeah, Pasco, real quick. Do you think, going back to that Riddick goal, do you think that's something necessarily where you have all five guys on the same side of the ice? And for a goalie with his game plan, do you think that's something his goalie coach, and again, this isn't knocking on anyone, again, we're all yeah. just yeah. trying to learn. Do that's you think that's? Do you think that's something they were talking about later on as far as – maybe not necessarily the best time to be down sealed there or do you think that's something he's just like you know it's a once in a once in a while thing you know I, I would I would have to look a little bit more but I would say that they would be definitely be talking about it because it really like if you really look at it I always try to look at it through the eyes of the goalie coach that's coaching them as well as the player you only have so much control the player is going to be playing the game yeah um, and maybe the player just feels more comfortable doing this uh, and then it would just become a, a, a question of, okay, it feels comfortable, but are you getting paid? Um, are you getting paid enough uh, to do this? And what I mean by pay is, are you, are you um, stopping pucks that, that are not even being shot yet? You know what I mean? Are you creating more opportunities by taking this action or are you creating less opportunities by creating this action? Yeah. For me, this is what Carey Price does. I'll just pause it. This player usually is coming down here, and as soon as that puck touches here, this is a timing mechanism that it's clear because I've watched Kerry do it a bunch of times, and they probably have changed it now, but as soon as he goes there, Price goes to here, and that releases the D-man on the far side. Does that make sense? So he comes yep. down here, Kerry goes down, boom, and that puck goes ripping through this cross area east-west, and look at he's a triangle on the wrong side of the road. So okay. I would say that they probably, like knowing Jordan Sigalette, um, he, he probably had that conversation with Riddick uh, and going, you know, okay, what was your purpose? Like, what is it, you know, what were you trying to derive out of this position? Um, you know, it's not necessarily that bad, but if you look at someone, if you look at someone like Jonathan Quick getting out of an RVH, like I showed you guys the last time, he is phenomenal and very strong at getting out of the RVH, whereas Riddick looked a little bit late getting up. And in that scenario, it puts you in a real bad position. And I think he probably would have stopped the puck had he not had all that energy moving forward. Like he's, you could see he's, he's communicating, watch that guy over there. And then he's looking up and scanning. He's aware, but maybe he's just aware and comfortable. Maybe he turned into a fan for a quick second, or maybe he just got caught looking. Like some of those guys, like, um, like Ben Bishop, I remember uh, talking to him at, at the access camp and, and talking to him about being down. Just got to remember, those guys are huge. They're six seven, so when they get up, they leave big holes down on the ice. Whereas a smaller goalie doesn't leave the same holes on the ice, but they leave them more, you know, above the shoulders. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So I would say, yeah. I, I mean, I'm I'm sure they talked about it, but again, it's if we were in a court of law, I wouldn't be able to tell you what Jordan was thinking or what <laughs> what Riddick was thinking because I wasn't there. <laughs> but when we're looking at this, here's positional strategies. We're almost done, guys. But when in positional strategies, you look at angles and depth management, ABC, one, two, three. So you look at control action and block, and there's lots of space to write. And of course, there's more space uh, um, in the rest of the, of the game plan book. But for you guys, if you're going to create your own game plan book or, uh, you know, you're just writing down the scenarios, thinking them through and, and writing notes about what you feel as though is, is best suited for you. But these are the timing mechanisms. I find that uh, the block zone is where they score the majority of the goals simply because there's rebounds, there's little tap in plays, there's east west plays that take place. And, you know, time can be our friend and our, and our enemy at the same time. So when I look at the ice, I see it like that and I see it like that. Um, and, and I draw them on the ice so that the goaltenders get a chance to see them and, and know. But here, here are the three positions of block. Uh, you're, you're on your post, you're on your post and you're at the 50 crease. So again, if I was to go back, you see the triangle and then you see where they dominate and that play is all going to be taking place in the, in the white paint surrounding the blue paint below the, below, below both circles. So for those guys that are watching that, um, may not understand what I'm saying there, I'll, I'll go back here. 
So um, the play is all going to take place in this area here, and it's all going to take place in this area here. Some will spill over for passes here. For some reason, they like to pass here, and, and they like to drive the net and stuff here. So you, you can start to look at predictability, but our coaches look at, uh, you know, look at ways to stop pucks here, stop pucks here, stop pucks here, and then move into passes and things like that. But that gives you a little bit of an idea. And when we're looking at this segment, we're looking at pucks that are played just on the outside of that area. And we need to seal the ice. And remember the 22 inches, right? 22 inches away from the top of the crease is only two, uh, is only, or sorry, I should say, it's only 22 inches the top of the net at the edge of the crease. So we'll go through a couple of block zone scenarios. Okay, so um, we get to see it from a better angle. So we're in this scenario here, and just like I talked about, um, the puck comes down. Uh, he's down below the goal line now. Now, uh, historically, we'd see goalies go into an RVH here, right? So you see guys hit that line, and then boom, they're in an RVH. Uh, in this case, uh, Bobrovsky decides to stay up, and he's in a good position here. And then you can see that the player's backhanded, so the, de the defenseman is pushing him down below the goal line. So here comes the pass. What's going to be the problem here for Bobrovsky? He hasn't scanned for the guy in the slot. Well, I mean, let's assume that he's, he can see him because you can see the stick is, about, is in front of his mask. So he knows he's there, but it's not going to be well, – what, what do you think he's, he, he could do a better job at doing? Getting flatter. Flatter? What else? He hasn't really set up. Oh, his weight is on the first post. So he That's should right. put the weight in between. Like, in between. Uh, it's – I think the, the weight thing is okay. The weight thing is okay. Okay, the weight thing is okay. So what, what else do you think it is? What about his ability to block the pass? So watch Sorry, his stick. What do you see about his stick there? Do you think that, that could have been prevented? Most of the blades below the goal line. Yeah, and it's point and and the tip or the toe of the blade is pointed towards the post, isn't it? So there goes the pass, and then in in the net it goes. So you'll see it down here again. Puck comes down. You'll start to see the play come through. You see that? And boom, it's in the net. So we we have to do a really good job. The reason why I say that is because uh, Rob Tallis in Florida, he's a real. Uh, big proponent of protecting that space, that area that would, was normally blue, but they've now taken it away. He's a real proponent of, of making sure we, we take ownership of this area and not allow these things to go through, okay? Um, and if it does get through, then we need to make sure that we're, you know, that we're gonna be a, a attacking, obviously, this blade, but not attacking too hard and too, too wide. And a lot of late, later guys coming in, so. Um, does that make sense, guys? We'll let this run through. Uh, I just have a question. Yep. If he, if the guy walking came out and he uh, just came up in front of the goal line, uh, would he be in the right position or what, what would he do there? So this guy here, like actually carrying his, the puck and going? No, just his stick going on top of the goal line and then shooting it. Okay, so because him he's, coming he's, down and his stick is here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what would, what would the scenario you would use be? Uh, probably just – be ready for a VH, and then if he shoots it, then VH. Yeah, if there's if there's no backside pressure there, there's no yeah. question a VH would be would be a good scenario. And I how many how many goalie coaches on here here from goalies? I don't like to use a VH; it doesn't feel comfortable or whatever. Um, if they know that you're not going to use a VH, then really good skills coaches are going to know that you're going to do one of two things: you're either going to overlap, or you're going to RVH. So now the plan to beat you has just gotten 33 percent better right? Because you're, you're not doing something where it's going to require you to move the least. And, um, and you've got two helpers here. So if your stick is above that line, the net is only as wide as your pad anyway. So, um, then, shouldn't, so then shouldn't his, he be more face towards the player? Uh, the player Instead with the of puck? Being flatter? Yeah, just a little bit. Well, he's splitting the difference here, right? Yeah. See, you see the little scan here? Watch. Watch his head. You see that? Watch yeah. again. It's very slight, but he sees the player, right? He sees the, the guy that's going to get in behind two of his players. There he goes. See that? 
So in this scenario, he stopped on the, he, he actually okay. overcompensated, but he's trying to take away the whole net and it didn't work out. So this is, this is the same scenario, I think. Oh no, this is the, um, this is a great little play again, Calgary versus Florida. This is the next game. So watch, there's a scenario again, right? But would, would he even have a remote chance of stopping that puck with a stick? No. It's, it's, that's, that's, uh, it seems close, but it's actually far. And if he reached for it and missed, he'd be totally screwed. So what ended up happening here is he, he maintained his position. His eyes moved quickly to the stick. Do you guys see how fast his head moved towards the receiving stick? It was, it was on it right away. And he used, he used um, so there's a scan. He used a, a projected angle. So what he did was he brought his glove right out over top to that 22 inch mark and closed down on the space. I mean, that's, if you guys see that. So look at how fast his head got there. And then his movement was already starting. So as he comes across and loads, that, that blocker comes right out. You see how far that, that blocker is in comparison to where he is? I mean, it's a three-quarter crease or a little, even 80% of the crease right there, and he makes the save. It was a beautiful, beautiful save. But it gives you an idea that people are trying to do the same things, right? They're trying to – that's you know, something that we can marvel as goalies and goalie coaches. Here's Jack Campbell. Okay, so this is a very common play. We'll get a chance to see it from the side too. So you see him come into position and he's down in a, um, in a paddle down. Actually a pretty good position overall. Um, when he pushes off, you know, we, we can argue uh, the point of he could maybe attack the puck or, or get to the other side, which is very difficult to do when you have your foot planted. But what happens here? He doesn't go to the post. Well, it's he's tough. Passing. It's tough, but what do you what do you notice about yeah. his body right here? Gets elevated. Yeah, he's broken the seals. The only thing that's touching the ice are just the uh, the boots, mm -hmm. uh, and the rest of the body is is off the ice. So it's really important to kind of again respect the fact that we have to we have to seal. If you seal the ice, you'll control the game, and in that scenario, it just didn't quite work out for him. So we'll see this play as well. Okay, so again, moving down into a position, um, we'll see him from this position again. So you see that pass on the zone entry, and then there's that save right onto, uh, right onto the stick here. So we wanna spray the glass if we can on any low ice shots. I just wanna go back to that other one. So here we are here, and then as that player comes around, He's moving. So that's why it's so important for us to recognize. Jack is, uh, he was trained by Mike uh, and it trained him since he was quite young. But when you look at this player, watch how fast Jack's eyes are on that puck. So he's on, he's on the receiving player, but where's his toe caps? <laughs> so he's going to have a rough time getting square. And when he's trying to fight to get square and rotate his body, like trying to get that way, this guy is going to use his momentum and, and carry him across. So here he goes here. Now he's got to get across and try to stop the puck. It's very difficult to do. So your crease work, your crease management becomes really, really critical as you start to move through. Here's another really good picture out of it. Look where his shoulders are, his hips are. He's trying to stop him from behind. This one here is just, uh, um, again, there's that little pass out. You see that? Pa pass go. Right, from an Question. RDH. Yeah. Uh, from on that last play when he was cutting across, would that be a good play to poke check? This one here? Cause, yeah, because he's cutting in and he's like pretty close. So would that be a good play to, to poke check? Let's take a look. Um, if he was, was right-handed, probably. Right? If you poke check here and you miss, what's this guy going to do? Just uh, wrap around. Yeah, and it doesn't take much, right? And you're going to be your your elbow, your blocker, everything's going to be forward. So now he's going to go right around you longwise. If you were right-handed, absolutely, because he has to bring that puck uh, low and then across your body. So I kind of look at look at it like if you're going to poke check, does he have to bring this puck across 
his body and yours. If he does, there's a, there's a strike zone in there. But in this area here, he can receive the puck. And if that stick was coming out, he just bumps it that way. And then um, you, might be, you might be left in the, in the dust like he, he kind of was there. He, he made a phenomenal play to try to get at it. But, I mean, he wasn't getting it. Hey, Pasco. Yeah. What do you think about using uh, the shaft of the stick to poke check it and keep him on, like, the same side of the ice, I guess? Yeah, so as he comes in and then, and then use a paddle down and then, and then twist your wrist to get him with the poke check. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, those are all options. I know it's... it's, it's um, I mean, that's a great option. It's just uh, the, the challenge is, is that can you do that 10 out of 10 times with the, with the result that you want? I kind of use this as a rule, um, 11 out of 12. And the reason why is that's over 90%. So can you stop the puck? and control the rebound 10 out of 11 times. If you can, then it's worth it. But if it's, if it's a risk, like if you're, if you're trying to hit, you know, hit on green in a casino <laughs> on the roulette wheel, well, there's only one green slide. So it better work or you're dead. I don't know. I, I kind of uh, go to the age of, uh, uh, you know, kind of ear to the side of caution and do something a little bit more compact and, and protect, the, uh, protect the opening to the net whether it's maybe entering that RBH or maybe getting into a VH and then sliding laterally versus getting caught off guard. So I think a lot of post seal receptions are really, really important, like recovering from a butterfly to post, recovering from a butterfly slide, recovering from, you know, by using some uh, adaptive skating or, or even standing in from a T push or a shuffle to get into the post. Any engagement in the post is going to help you, kind of re-engage on those passes. It'll help you get to that next level.